Okay, thank you, Ranjan. Um, I appreciate you inviting me to, to do this, and I, it gives me a chance to talk about some work that it may sound like it's fairly finished, but I don't think it is fairly finished. So I'm gonna, my talk's a little bit longer than 45 minutes, I'm afraid, and at the end, I'm going to essentially kind of do a reading of a piece of a video piece um, where I'm almost asking more questions than giving answers, and I would be, help, it would be helpful if we could try to think it together. Um, so yes, my title is Techno Aesthesis and Drone Vision, and I think it happens in eight sections. The first section, is it okay if I stand? It's better if I stand, probably, right? You can all see me, okay? It's up to you. I mean, I think. I could sit and it would be you less prefer. formal, but this is okay. Yeah. Okay, so the first section is called The New Aesthetic. We live in a world shaped and defined by computation, and it is one of the jobs of the critic and the artist to draw attention to the world as it truly is. These words succinctly express the gambit of the so-called new aesthetic movement inaugurated by artist James Bridle in a portentous blog post written on May 6, 2011. For Bridle and his fellow travelers, the new aesthetic constitutes a response to the computization of our culture and specifically to the disjunction the computation installs and progressively magnifies between technological becoming and human understanding. For Bridle and his colleagues, the world in which we now live is a highly technologized one that operates according to logics of its own that, and this is the key point, we humans simply can't understand. In the face of this autonomization of computational culture, art requires a new mandate to expose the transfer networks and protocols of the network and the actual substance of information it discloses. The new aesthetic articulates the deep coherence and multiplicity of connection and influences of the network itself. For writer Andrew Blum, this birth announcement of the new aesthetic was quickly followed by an even more important breakthrough moment, Bridal's encounter with a hobbyist model of an MQ-1 Predator drone. What Bridal saw in the model of the drone was nothing less than the most dramatic and violent representation of a far broader condition, the network condition of contemporary life. The drone, Bridal notes, embodies so many of the qualities of the network, sight at a distance, action at a distance, and it's invisible. I started thinking about the drone as an emanation of the network itself, not just a surveillance platform, but a dark mirror. To begin to unpack how and why the drone furnishes a figure for our network condition, the fact that we now literally live within the internet from which we never effectively log off, Bridal created an exemplary artwork, Drone Shadow 001, a chalk outline of a full-scale drone uh, traced on the concrete ground of a parking lot in the London suburb of Shoreditch. Subsequently photographed and uploaded to the photo sharing site Flickr, this work of art congealed a period of research in which Bridal had gathered images, quotes, and videos that attested to a new aesthetic of the future, subsequently to be inventoried and expanded in a Tumblr blog, whose guiding principle was, and I quote, we, that we could no longer clearly see, much less understand, the effects of the networked world we built. Following yet another breakthrough moment, a panel at the 2012 South by Southwest Tech Festival in Austin, Texas, Bridal's aesthetic intervention congealed into a program for converting our acquaintance with machine vision into new ways of seeing. From this point forward, the movement became anchored by a collective will to empathize with machines, to try to understand them on their own terms, and building on such understanding, to find new ways to contemplate and understand the world in which we live, the world of the internet. This desire to see the world through the machine informs the new aesthetic Wunderkammer that is Bridal's Tumblr site. Here we find a rich panoply of images that capture the, quote, eruption of the digital into the physical. Images of everything from information visualizations to satellite views, images of pan, uh, parametric architecture, surveillance cameras, digital image processing, data moshed video frames, 
glitches, voxelated 3D pixels, dazzle camo, render ghosts, and retro 8-bit graphics from the 1980s. What these images collectively express, for the proponents of the new aesthetic at least, is something like the world from the perspective of the machine. As author Bruce Sterling puts it, this, or more pipe, this is, and, and I would interject more pointedly, this is supposed to be how contemporary reality looks to our pals, the visionary machines. I say this is supposed to be rather than this is, because I agree with Sterling and others that the new aesthetic remains unconvincing. It correctly defines a problem, the contemporary disjunction of machine from human, but it utterly fails to grapple with the real impact of that disjunction. Rather than taking seriously the problem of our apparent non-relation to technical operations that remain both opaque to us and beyond our cognitive grasp, the new aesthetic immediately falls back on a representational suture to fill the void of a truly alien machining operationality of the world, Bridal and his collaborators simply substitute images of how machinic processes appear to and for human vision. As Sterling succinctly puts it, dazzle camouflage has nothing to do with machine vision. Machines are incapable of a state of mind like dazzle. Camo is all about human vision. Similarly, glitches aren't machine vision either but rather failures of machine processing and failures of machine displays built for human vision. Section two, drone logic. The same, the same contrast between an authentically alien machine vision and a human view of and through machines. Sorry. The same contrast between an authentically alien machine vision and a human view of and through machine vision lies at the very heart of drones as technocultural phenomena. For art historian Thomas Stubblefield, drones operate through a system of visual nominalism, a system of seeing that eschews objects and identities in favor of spatial relations and empirical data. Drones utilize edge detection, motion capture, auto-tagging, and facial recognition in order to supplant the perspectival Albertian image with a catalog of distances, volumes, heat signatures, and behavioral patterns. In addition to their fundamentally different, indeed fundamentally alien mode of vision, of which humans can only have a metaphoric experience, drones are exemplary because of their capacity for gathering data. For media theorist Mark Andreevich, this capacity is the reason the drone plays an exemplary role as a figure, as the figure, for the emerging logics of ubiquitous, always-on, sensor-based monitoring. It explains why the drone avatar of our contemporary network condition, it explains why the drone is the avatar of our contemporary network condition. In theorizing drones and droning theory, a recent article of Andreevich's, he argues that, and I quote, abstracting away from the figure of the unmanned flying device, the notion of drone logic broadly construed unfolds the shared characteristics of distributed forms of network data collection and response. The promise of the drone as hyper-efficient information technology is fourfold. It extends and multiplies the reach of the senses. It saturates the times and spaces in which sensing takes place. It automates the sense-making process, and it tends toward the automation of response. The shift from drone to drone logic underscores the capacity of our contemporary information technologies to exert a continuous background presence rather than more targeted discrete forms of interactivity. In this sense, drones perfectly capture the operation of the entire network that, through, though largely invisible from any particular vantage point, underlies the circulation of information in our world today. The figure of the drone, notes Andreevich, necessarily invokes the underlying and quasi-centralized data link, the costly information network behind the interface and the entities that can access and operate it. Drone logic can thus be defined as the confluence of two operations in one, the deployment of ubiquitous always-on network sensors for the purposes of automated data collection, processing, and response. 
Like other information technologies for which they stand, drones thus function both as medium and as probe. As the center of a mode of military operations that promotes secrecy and clandestine operations, drones perfectly figure both the invisibility and the cognitive inscrutability that Bridle and his colleagues attribute to computation in general. In this respect, the aesthetics of revelation that lies at the heart of the new aesthetic and that provokes criticism from those concerned about the movement's passivity and its exclusively contemplative focus finds a profound instantiation, and I would suggest an important extension, in the work of a group of artists who place drones at the center of their practice. For all of these artists, a group that includes Graham Harwood, Trevor Paglin, Josh Begley, Julian Oliver, and Omar Fest, the task of art in the age of drone warfare and of networked communication media in general is to make visible and perhaps to destabilize from in, within the complex set of relations that inform drone operations. Like global citizens of 21st century capitalism generally, which is equally to say, like users implicated within today's global system of planetary computation, these artists fully accept their own implication within the systems they mediate. There simply is no outside the drone, and no outside the drone logic for which it stands. As Thomas Stubblefield puts it, these artists eschew the, eschew the difference of critique, seeking instead to initiate blockages and intensify existing relations, processes that work within the ecological model of the kill chain so as to amplify its power differentials and ultimately produce new distributions. In this, drone art necessarily treads a fine line between the utopian potential of the network and the reaffirmation of a dispersed mode of power. So section three, exposing drones. Nowhere is this paradoxical logic better captured than an artist Trevor Paglin's projects, Drone Vision and Drones. Drone Vision extends, sorry, Drone Vision presents extended <coughs> loops of US drone footage that have been captured by an amateur satellite hacker. In a move that may appear to meet Bridal's injunction to empathize with the machine, here the aesthetic gesture is simply to reverse the gaze of the camera. As Stubblefield astutely grasps, rather than revealing secret operations, Haglund's piece centers on, quote, visualizing the way in which the subject of the image is recast by the eye of the drone. Yet what results is not empathy, not a seeing from the standpoint of the machine, but at best, merely a tenuous or a broken metaphor for drone vision. What viewers see in the banal content of empty and barren landscape, replayed without incident, is the operationality of drone logic caught, as it were, in the flesh. And I do have a video of this on my computer, but I couldn't find it. But at any rate, it's simply like a 30 second loop that just shows a drone <coughs> hovering over this um, landscape, and it's looped over and over again. Indeed, as the video loops again and again, viewers are made aware of the way the drone camera imbues the subject of the image with expectation, and more broadly, the processes by which its vision is structured according to, and for all intents and purposes, coincident with the attack. Right, so the argument is that the, the looping of it builds an affective intensity that focuses the attention on the idea that the whole thing, all of this, is um, aimed solely to this moment of attack. The response elicited by the piece is far from being primarily contemplative or critical. By ensnaring viewer response at the level of affect, with each viewing of the looped video intensifying the feeling of impending strike, the work implicates the viewer in the complex and clandestine relationality of drone war. Indeed, it quite literally enfolds viewer affect into the associated milieu to use a term from Simon Don, to whom I will turn shortly, that supports the individuation of the kill chain, and more broadly, the drone logic it instantiates. Untitled Drones, Haglund's series of long-range and long-exposure images of drones in the sky above the Nellis Range outside Las Vegas plays out a strategy fully complementary to drone vision's reversal of the gaze. 
In this case, the aesthetic gesture of revelation operates in the service of revealing precisely the disjunction between the machinic vision of the drone and the machine-assisted vision of the artist photographer. Utilizing a wide-angle lens and exposure times ranging from 30 minutes to several hours, right? And he actually uses lenses that are um, made for um, astrophysical observation, right? To capture um, things that are happening across these immense distances. And he speaks about how it changes the aesthetics of photography. So there's no depth of field anymore, for example, right? Um, so it's a kind of a, technolo a technolo technological transformation of the photographer himself, right? In the face of this other vision system, the drone system. So Paglin captures barely visible traces of drones flying in the sky, traces that become visible to humans only because they can be inscribed technically in photographs that condense massive, properly inhuman durations or presence of time. In a stark contrast to the acute perception of the drone vision machine, right, which from 5,000 feet can see what kind of shoes a person is wearing, for example, the images Paglin produces with his long exposure shots present only a vague hint of their target in the form of practically indiscernible ripples or folds inscribed in the vast expanses of sky. Just as drone vision's reversal of the gaze underscores the impenetrability and inaccessibility of machine vision, Paglin's drones, which is this series of photographs, foreground only the most tenuous continuity of vision between the human and the machine, and also a continuity that itself is technically mediated. But the important point is that it nonetheless is a continuity. It is a material connection. If cameras built for humans are able to capture inscriptions of cameras built for machines, cameras that are meant to operate both outside of and in ways antithetical to human vision, what is thereby attested to is the irreducible materiality or physicality of what appears invisible, secret, and inscrutable, whether because of ontological factors, the alien operationality of machine vision, or political ones, the intentional effort to remove military operations from public view. As Paglin rather matter-of-factly puts it, and I quote, if you're going to build a secret airplane, you can't do it in an invisible factory. Here it is not empathy, but an absolute refusal of the technological sublime that is at issue. By insisting on this most tenuous trace of visible connection as a link between human and drone, Paglin's work makes the point about our implication within the network in a most striking way. Whether we are aware of our implication in a concerned and critical way, or with Bridal and his collaborators celebratory of our ignorance in the face of alien technology, Paglin's trace images of drones powerfully insist that our implication is part of a larger relationality, and also that our experience of this relationality is necessarily both radically partial and, for that reason, phenomeno-technical. It can only occur through our co-functioning with technologies. In this case, the specially equipped photographic camera whose operational logics we neither share nor fully understand. Far from being a source of defeatism or aestheticism, our disjunction from the operationality of our machines, paradoxically coupled with our phenomeno-technical dependence on machines as just outlined, is the very basis for a renewal of aesthetics in the age of drone logic. What, I want to ask, is the role of aesthetics in a world where ratios of human sensation and perception are fundamentally out of step with the sensory operationality of technical machines with the realm of technical sensing. If aesthetics in its original brief meaning of aesthesis designates human perceptual apprehension of the material world, and if aesthetics in its specifically modern post 18th century meaning describes the disinterested human engagement with a work of art or art object, what if anything of the heritage of aesthetics continues to be relevant today? And how must we challenge and expand this heritage to address the disjunction between humans and machines that has been my focus thus far. So section four, Simon Don's aesthetics. My effort to answer these questions will take me on a detour through the work of a philosopher, Gilbert Simondon, 
who, um, who I'm working on in a much more broad way um, in, in other current work, um, whose theories of individuation and of technical existence inform my current research. Simon Don is a French philosopher and historian of technology who trained with Georges Canguillem and Maurice Merleau-Ponty. He is the author of two major works. The first of these, On the Mode of Existence of Technical Objects, originally published in French in 1958, explores the logic of technicity that informs the lineages of technical objects from their moment of absolute invention, his term, to their point of maximum concretization or plurifunctional convergence. By arguing for a separation of the logic of technicity from social and economic factors, from relations of both use and work, Simon Don endeavored to deploy the operationality of machines as a positive factor in the development of human culture. On the basis of a radicalization of cybernetics, Simon Don sought to overcome the alienation of culture from technics and to help create an authentic technical culture. The second of Simon Don's major works individuation in the light of notions of form and information develops a comprehensive theory of what he calls individuation, encompassing physical, living, psychic, and social domains that is predicated on the primacy of relationality over terms related, which is equally to say on the primacy of individuation as a process over the individual that results on the basis of that process, and which remains in an open relationship with a larger field of individuation always. For Simon Null, the individual arises on the basis of a larger worldly process of individuation, and is hence forever constitutionally incomplete, and for two reasons. First, the individual is inseparable from an associated milieu, a segment of the environment that constitutes the supporting ground, a segment of the environment that constitutes the supporting ground for its becoming. And second, the individual is in permanent relation with its pre-individual charge, the larger worldly energy that operates as a permanent potential source informing whatever novelty its becoming enjoys. Notwithstanding the vast range of his thought, Simon Don never managed to produce a fully developed aesthetics. This is not to say that the aesthetic did not play a role in his thinking. Indeed, in the third and final section of On the Mode of Existence of Technical Objects, which I read with some students and we all found it both mind-blowing and totally bizarre, um, Simon Nall theorizes the aesthetic as a compensatory mode of being in the world that follows upon the first dephasing of the magical unity of religion and techniques. Today, I want to argue for the centrality of the aesthetic within Simon Dole's philosophy. More precisely, the aesthetic, as I shall present it, constitutes a mode of worldly manifestation or revelation, what Simon Dole himself calls a phenerotechnic, from the Greek word phenaron, meaning appearance in itself or appearance independently of its appearance to a, a, a recipient or an observer. So um, the aesthetic constitutes a mode of worldly manifestation that complements, even as it exceeds the scope of the individuation of the knowledge of individuation that accompanies the individuation of the real. Let me try to express the significance of this difference. Where knowledge, even when it takes the form of data produced by measuring instruments, remains oriented to human understanding as a privileged mode of process aesthetic impressions, sorry, as a privileged mode of process, aesthetic impressions are modes through which humans can experience the self-revelation of the world without needing to be the privileged locus for such revelation. Okay, so let me say that again. Where knowledge, okay, so he's a cr critic of consciousness and knowledge, of the limitations of consciousness and knowledge, which for him always arise in the process of a larger individuation that has a lot of aspects that don't appear within the individual, the consciousness that it forms, right? So I'm arguing that aesthetics for him is, a, is in a certain way a supplement that accesses or, or manifests that extra dimension that's involved in the production of appearances that doesn't appear to consciousness or within the individual formed in this individuating process. So I'm gonna read my sentence again. Or knowledge, even when it takes the form of data produced by measuring instruments rather than human consciousness, remains oriented to human understanding as a privileged mode of process. Aesthetic impressions are modes through which humans can experience 
the self-revelation of the world, or let's just say the revelation of the world, without needing to be the privileged locus for such revelation. This quasi-autonomous operation of aesthetics, aesthetics as world manifestation, becomes increasingly more important as the technical mediation of the world advances and calls for some updating of Simondon's engagement with techniques. Despite theorizing three levels of technical operationality, element, object, and ensemble, Simondon's theory remains focused on the object and tends to concentrate on the purely technical lineages by which technical objects pursue their own essences at the expense of the greater relationality of techniques with the world. This focus on the object in isolation conflicts with Simondon's repeated claim that the post-industrial techniques, that post-industrial techniques both produce and require a shift to the level of the ensemble, or as we might say today, the network. Shifting to the level of the ensemble or network, however, does not mean interlinking separate technological objects. Far more fundamentally, it calls for a rethinking of the notion of technicity itself, such that this latter is no longer isolated within the isolated technical object as the functional or technical essence that is realized through the process of concretization, but rather obtains from the interrelationality and interoperability of technical processes and the elements that are operable in those processes. The technicity of technical ensembles, unlike the technicity of technical objects, is thus thoroughly social and political, and indeed can be understood as resulting from the unfolding of human activities into the milieu of the network itself. For Diego Viana, the convergence at issue in digital networks differs from the functional convergence that occurs in the concretization of a given technical object precisely because, and I quote, it returns to nature after having denied it. Given that nature for Simon Don includes the registers of the living, the psychic, and the collective, and not just the physical, this return to nature amounts to the enfolding of human activity into the technical. Digital networks, Viana continues, go further than technical ensembles considered in isolation inasmuch as they attach themselves to human reality in the same way as to natural reality. Their activity takes human actions, gestures, individuating activities, and so on, as the source of potentials and information that will take form digitally. Put more simply, in digital networks, the human is assimilated into the milieu. It becomes part of the larger environment, the source of environmental information that the technicized world of networks needs in order to operate its technicity. In this situation, the device that circulates information, and again I'm quoting Viana, which used to be the tool or the machine, is now the world itself. And with this shift to the highest stage of technicity, the point when the world itself becomes technicized, the human loses whatever independent agency it may have once enjoyed as wielder of the tool in the artisanal model of production, or as minder of the machine in the industrial age. And instead, the human becomes assimilated into a self-regulating system that operates through the imposition of restrictive technical logics on inputs and outputs. This is what we now refer to as algorithmic culture. So section six, aesthetic impressions in key places. It is precisely this situation that calls for a rethinking of the aesthetic. For if our age of planetary computation manifests a polytechnical convergence of separate ensembles into what Benjamin Bratton has recently called the accidental megastructure of the internet, what results is yet a higher level of technical mediation of the world, the world itself becoming technicized, where the separate infrastructural systems analyzed by Simondon, for example, the telephone system, the electrical grid, maintenance system for machines, and so on, are themselves rendered interoperational by the global computational network. Again, what is ultimately at stake in this development, aside from the heightened relationality linking separate systems, is the further enfolding of human activity and affect into the technical system. Human activity and affect play the role of environmental information for the network itself to operate the convergence of ensembles. Simondon expresses this development in a way that returns our attention 
to the aesthetic register, and I quote. Thus are constitu constituted certain key places. In French, the word is au, au lieu, or haut lieu, of, of the world. So th thus are constituted certain key places of the world, natural, technical, and human. The conjunction and interconnection of those key places creates this polytechnic universe, both natural and human. The structures of this reticulation become social and political. With this development, Simon Don notes, there occurs a fundamental shift in the relation between the human and the technical, a blurring of the distinction between individual world and the technical, and a concentration of action into the operationality of technical mediation itself. Technicity, and I'm quoting Simon Don, is part of the world, not only a set of means, but a set of conditions for action and incitation to act. We can switch our tools and instruments, Simon Don goes on to say, but we can, quote, never switch networks. We do not build networks ourselves. We can only attach ourselves to the network, adapt to it, participate in it. The network dominates and contains the human being's action. It dominates each technical ensemble. As I have suggested, there is some doubt concerning the capacity of philosophical thought, the individuation of the knowledge of the individuation of the real, to in Simon Nolte's mind, to express this contemporary operation of network technicity. If this is the case, it is due to the marginalization that the human, or rather the traditional modes of human agency, undergo following the shift to the network condition. To the extent that our activity and affect are absorbed by the network as information for its ongoing individuation, we form part of the milieu for its operationality and participate in this operationality, despite the lure of connection offered to us by social media platforms, what I have characterized in Feed Forward as their perverse pharmacological imperative. Uh, so we, we form part of the milieu for its operationality and participate in this operationality only passively and partially. In short, we cannot gain knowledge of this operationality from any position outside it. And I would say also whatever knowledge we can gain from a position inside it is radically partial and dependent on uh, what I'm trying to theorize here as aesthetic uh, mediation and worldly the appearance uh, of worldly appearances. Aesthetic mediation of the network fills the void left by this situation. As against both ancient and modern conceptions of aesthetics, as thesis and as art, respectively, Simon Don's conception of aesthetics as both a mode of experience, what he calls the aesthetic impression, and a mode of in situ world manifestation not necessarily centered on the human, makes possible and indeed operates as a finero of technics, a technical revelation of the operationality of networks from a perspective other than that of human use or work. Two aspects of Simon Don's aesthetics in particular inform its capacity to reveal the complex relationality of planetary computational networks through aesthetic impressions that make it experientially salient for humans, but without challenging it through the sorry, without channeling it through the specific and limited cognitive and sensory perspective of the human. So, two aspects of his aesthetics um, inform its capacity to reveal the complex relationality of these networks without channeling it through the human. First. The aesthetic impression gives a full picture of technicity as embedded in networks and as more than purely technical. When Simondo states that technicity includes both technical and non-technical modes of relation of the human and the world, he enfolds the social and political human activity and affect into technicity, while at the same time insisting that the resulting technicity is not the essence of the object, as he had earlier maintained, but rather a larger and open-ended relation of the technical with the world. In an analysis of the emission antennas on the plateau of Villebon, right, and he's writing in the 50s, right, so he's, the examples he have, has are, are old from our standpoint. So he's looking at the TV antennas and radio antennas on the plateau of Villebon outside of Paris. Simon Don himself attributes the superiority of techno-aesthetics precisely to this enfolding of the non-technical into technicity. The joy one finds moving through the new constructions on the plateau of Villebon is both technical and aesthetic. The techno-aesthetic feeling seems to be a category that is more primitive than the aesthetic feeling alone, sorry, or than the technical aspect considered from the angle of functionality alone, which is an impoverishing perspective. 
Second, and building upon this point, the aesthetic impression is a manifestation of the world's ongoing individuation at a specific moment, a manifestation that takes shape not through any subjective synthesis on the part of a human cognizer, but rather by organizing the world around and from the perspective of a key place, which crucially is not selected in virtue of the human. As a product of, as well as a complement to, a concrete technical organization of the world, the aesthetic impression thus recaptures something of the environmentality of, its, uh, of the now lost magical phase prior to any divide between subject and object, human and world. As Yves Michaud states, aesthetic thought presents itself as an effort to reconstitute a reticular universe in relation to the two poles of technics and religion which mark the first dephasing of the magical unity. It is a question, so to speak, of magic after the loss of magic. Art and works of art remake a reticular universe by immersing it not in a disappeared primitive magical unity, but in the real universe that issued from the phase difference of the magical world. The aesthetic impression, in short, expresses the technical organization of the ground as a key place that resonates according to what Simondon calls a superior kinship with other key places in an analog of the magical network of the universe. Okay, section seven. Returning now to our discussion of drones as exemplary and of drone logic as exemplary of our contemporary digital culture and specifically to the status of drones as data links within, a vast, within vaster information systems. Let me conclude by exploring two examples of drone art that operate as modes of experimentation with the power of aesthetic impression to express the technical organization of the world without privileging the human perspective, or put another way, in ways that treat human activity and affect as components of that technical organization as part of its environment and not as its operational principle. The first of these projects, James Bridle's Dronestagram, experiments with the implication of 21st century data citizens within the complex kill chain of the drone. The aim of this work, I shall claim, is less to take action or to inspire users to take action on Western drone operations in the Middle East than it is to mark the tenuous and highly ambivalent relationality that most often invisibly, yet still in a material way, indelibly links internet users in the West to the kill chain of drone logic. Inaugurated in 2012 and concluded in 2015, Dronestagram is an assembly of aerial views of landscapes in Yemen, Pakistan, and Somalia that Bridal captured from Google Street View based on the research of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism into the geographic coordinations of noted drone strikes and drone campaigns. Bridal's aesthetic gesture is to post the images of sites of drone attacks to Instagram together with a caption describing the site and or the mission in order to expose the public to information about these normally covert operations. But more importantly, to allow the public to participate in an evolving narrative about drone operations, as well as to compel the public to grasp its own implication in the drone logic together with its alienation from the latter's operationality. By the end of the work's active life in 2015, Bridal's Instagram site had amassed 18,200 followers and had spawned a wealth of highly ambivalent and sometimes highly incendiary opinions, both about drone war and about Bridal's own work as a mode of commentary and intervention into drone war. In a talk on the work, Gary Kafer usefully explains how the inclusion of captions prompts users to inflect the images with their own affective responses. In a move that operates to narrativize and in some sense to reclaim the affective register of their own lives, that following Simon Dahl's understanding of the network is enfolded into and forms a key part of the milieu of contemporary planetary computation. I agree with Kafer that the addition of captions supplements the poverty of the image. The image, he notes, quote, is not enough to convey a sense of the location or the destruction incurred by drone operations. And I would add that it supplements the poverty of the image by creating an interpretive space or a spacing around the image 
that is nothing other than a frame for exploring and engaging the protracted temporality of the drone operation, a temporality not restricted to the moment of the bombing, but one that includes processes of identification, identification and targeting before the attack, as well as coping with destruction and death after the attack. The responses the work elicits from users, which are added to the Instagram site in this, and in this way become part of the evolving work, extend the spacing of the protracted temporality of drone operations in a way that polarizes the drone logic of the internet in relation to a key place, namely the relationality afforded by social media platforms like Instagram, and thus produces an aesthetic impression of the entire network from the perspective of one of its terminals, and specifically in relation to the ambivalence of this terminal as it once part of algorithmic logic that renders power invisible, as well as an opportunity for users to insert themselves into this logic in potentially consequential ways. On this score, the fact that Bridal posts images of sites of significant drone operations prior to their happening is highly significant. In one sense, the result of a technical necessity or limitation, the limited stock of images from the database of Google Street Maps, this situation posting the images of these drone sites or sites of drone bombings prior to the bombing, right? This situation is aesthetically salient precisely because it polarizes our relation to drone operations and to the larger drone logic they exemplify around a situation that through retrospection becomes aesthetically laden with contingent potentiality. The image opens the time of its future as a space of open-ended information awaiting, awaiting a user to receive it by in, by, in effect, reclaiming the affectivity that is enfolded as information to drive network operations. For this reason, I would argue that these images, together with the sites they image, but also, and most crucially, the relation between image and site, in turn become a key place that both materializes a worldly manifestation, a phenaron, an appearance without an appearer, or an appearance in itself, and creates an aesthetic impression. When users double tap to like a post on Dronestagram, they unwittingly and involuntarily perform a gesture that chillingly reenacts the drone tactic of striking the same site in quick succession to neutralize respondents rushing to the scene. Yet what actually happens in this moment is less an experience of the technical sublime and the user's absolute alienation from the machine logic of the drone and our contemporary algorithmic culture more generally than an aesthetic revelation from the standpoint of the network itself of the user's implication within that logic and following the repetition of the double tap, a potential aesthetic reflection on that implication from the user's own standpoint. Given this situation, we can appreciate users' complaints that, quote, commenting on inefficacious commenting, sorry, com that commenting on Instagram does not actually achieve anything, as well as the further implication that such inefficacious commenting lies at the very heart of the drone logic identified by Andreevich. However, we can also understand that these reactions are largely beside the point. If, as I am claiming here, the aesthetic work performed by Dronestagram aims precisely to reveal the impotence of the user whose affectivity is enfolded into the network itself to gain any definitive cognitive grasp of the network's operationality. On this score, the work has a far more modest aesthetic goal, to expose the operation of a network that includes humans as predominantly passive components and to produce an aesthetic impression that affords humans the opportunity to experience by way of a local in situ reappropriation of their own expropriated affectivity, their own implication within the drone logic of contemporary network culture. Okay, so section eight, the last section, um, which is about Omar Fest's video, 5,000 Feet is the Best, who which many of you probably have seen. Um, in a recent paper, Jeremy Packer and Joshua Reeves develop a powerful argument that the ultimate telos of drone warfare is the complete removal of the human from the kill chain. This development they refer to incisively, if inelegantly, as humanectomy. As the <laughs> humanectomy, yes. As the endpoint of a drone logic that garners rhetorical force from its claims to eliminate danger to military pilots and personnel. This telos 
positions the human as the ultimate source for the fog of war. Not only can humans not endure the high altitude and high speed missions of the unmanned vehicles, the bandwidth limitations humans introduce into the kill chain, slow cognitive processing and cumbersome telecommunication and the cumbersome telecommunicational circuits necessary to keep them in the loop. These bandwidth limitations lead to high financial costs and data vulnerability. For this reason, Hacker and Reeves explain the current trend is to replace remote sensing and decision making with onboard data processing. And I'm quoting them. According to the Department of Defense, automated onboard data processing can help minimize the critical bandwidth necessary to transmit ISR data, so intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance data, to the warfighter and may also be suitable for reducing the intelligence officer workload and decreasing time in the kill chain. Automated target recognition enables target discrimination, i.e. reporting contacts of interest instead of sending entire images for human interpretation. Looking to the future, the trend is the full elimination of human understanding and of the human as such, humanectomy, as a technological solution to the problem of the fog of war. And I quote them again. The human, with its limited vision, its juvenile data processing capacities, and its highly vulnerable communicational processes, is the ultimate source of the fog of war. By contrast, the swarm, right, which is the, the technology that they're describing as what the military is now investing in, so a swarm of small devices that are communicationally um, synchronized with one another. So by contrast, the swarm, a combat cloud of automated drones with full interoperability, voting mechanisms, and implicit communication is, quote, the ideal solution for dispensing with the fog of war. I draw your attention to humanectomy as the telos of the drone logic we've been describing here, less to move our discussion into the realm of science fiction, although I'm fascinated by that too, um, so less to move our discussion into the realm of science fiction than to refocus the spotlight on the problem of drone vision as I have sought to construct it here, namely as a paradoxical invisibility to the human of the machinic realm of sensing. As I understand this logic, the elimination of the human is not so much a new telos, but rather the animating project of drone logic from the very start. As Peter Asaro argues in an article called The Labor of Surveillance, drone warfare is a form of bureaucratized, bureaucratized killing that requires the full instrumentalization of human subjectivity. Critical to Asaro's argument is the framing of pilot and sensor burnout as an occupational rather than a medical category. Military studies of burnout, and I quote Asaro, are primarily concerned with attaining the optimal level of physical and psychological uh, functioning of the drone operators as a means of maximizing their labor productivity and minimizing the risk of costly mishaps. In this sense, the health of the drone operators is not an end, but a means to an end. There is a clear distinction being made in these studies by the military between psychological stress that interferes with job performance, which is burnout, which is a problem that they want to solve, and psychological stress that interferes with daily life or mental health, PTSD, which is something they want to deny. By choosing to build his 30-minute narrative film, 5,000 Feet is the Best, around the testimony of a former Predator pilot now suffering PTSD, Israeli artist Omar, Omar Fast contests drone logic, the paradoxical invisibility to the human of the machinic realm of sensing, from the standpoint of its most vulnerable link, the human. The ultimate source of vulnerability in the, form, in the film, the testimony of the former drone pilot is deployed by FAS to mark the impossibility of reducing PTSD to burnout, the impossibility of bureaucratizing subjectivity such that it won't bleed over into normal life. And by choosing to double the real drone pilot with a fictional drone pilot, himself suffering from severe headaches and other symptoms of PTSD, who narrates three bizarre stories each containing a moral, well, two of which contain a moral and one has an implicit moral, directly relevant to the impossibility of bureaucratizing subjectivity. Faust exfoliates the vulnerability at the heart of this narrative in expanding layers of reference, 
that potentially touch everyone, not simply those directly implicated in drone operations and the kill chain, but those who suffer from its consequences, its victims, its myriad victims, as well as those who benefit or at least gain peace of mind or blissful ignorance from its promise as a clean means of waging war. From this standpoint, it is significant that the film begins with the fictional drone pilot being interviewed in a Las Vegas hotel room. We only hear from the real pilot whose face in the three segments that appear remains a blur after each narrated story. Framed in this way, the testimony of the real pilot, the human at the source of this film, becomes something far more and far more powerful than the mere experience of one man. The experience of leakage he narrates of his time as a drone pilot bleeding into his home and family life, into his own daily existence, also bleeds into the fictional vignettes and into the virtual series of imaginable scenarios for which they stand, and which would ultimately include every viewer's own story. It is also significant that the frame of each narrative is a repetition with a difference. The interview scene, or the core of the interview scene with the fictional pilot, is repeated verbatim before each of the three stories, though it is refilmed each time. As such, it produces a sense that the vulnerability at the heart of the story exfoliates in different directions and in an infinite series, into an infinite series of stories, right? You have one, two, three versions of a different story, which are not meant to be complements, but meant to be substitutes that can go on infinitely, right? That it bleeds finally into myriad different life scenarios simultaneously. So I now want to show you a few clips from the film. There's no difference between us. We did the same job. If you're not a real pilot, you're still alive. You're not a real girl. No, I mean, I know what you mean. You're talking about bodies and places. Euclidean shit. Like train drivers in the 1880s or something. Sure you're okay. There was this guy here who loved trains, you know. I don't know. It was like a 40-year-old guy. Um, harmless. Maybe a little retarded. Okay, so he's then gonna so this this frame narrative. This core of it, where the journalist asks him what's the difference between you and a real pilot, happens three times in the film, prior to which, uh, at the, uh, uh, before the fictional drone pilot then tells a story. And each time, there's slight differences in that core narrative, and then there are some other segments, like an encounter with a maid who gives him some aspirin or something, painkiller, um, him being in the hallway and trying to enter the wrong room, that differentiate these moments, right? But in a sense, I'm saying they're they're set up this way to suggest the idea that this film goes on in an infinite series of these kinds of narratives. Okay, so then he tells these three really bizarre stories. The first two have explicit morals that come out in the questioning after the story. So the first is the story about a guy who's so fascinated with trains from a young age, um, and importantly, I would say, gets portrayed as a black guy. the last time you saw him. Right? Um, loves trains ever since. You know, most of us outgrow this phase when we discover sports I'm jerking off. Okay, so this guy is so fascinated with trains that one day he decides to um, impersonate a train conductor. So he goes and he um, dresses up as a train conductor and leaves his clothes and his keys in a locker and um, drives um, the train all day long, right? Um, and then when he's done, he goes home and he, and he I think he, he Forgets to he forgets the lock of the locker or something, so he can't get his keys to his house. So he tries to break into his house, and he gets arrested breaking into his own house. Okay, and after this story, um, the 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 journalist asks the pilot, "What does this have to do with you know drones?" And the pilot says, um, "The moral of the story is you keep your work life and your domestic life separated." Okay, so it's a moral in the first story. It's a moral about uh, it's a moral from the standpoint of like how to fit into the drone system, right? If you're a drone pilot, you have to keep your work life and your and your um, domestic life separated. And this is a particular problem for drone pilots because they sit in these bunkers outside of 
Las Vegas, you know, s sitting there piloting a drone all day long or all night long, and then they get off work and they drive home and they go back to their families and whatever, and they have to like all of a sudden be okay, be normal, right? Whereas if you're actually in the con in the field of combat in Afghanistan or in Yemen, you know, you're in that all the time, right? So it's the transition that becomes a problem. So here we have a moral that in a certain way speaks to a necessity of being a drone pilot, what you have to do in order to survive, okay? The second story that the fictional drone pilot tells is about uh, a, a, a couple who operate this con in Vegas casinos where they, um, and, and each of these stories is prompted by, this story is prompted by the drone pilot actually seeing this guy, who I think is Horace Whitaker, right, in the hallway, right? Um, and at the end of the story, it emerges that, um, I think the journalist asks him, why is, the, why is this guy you're telling the story about black? And the drone pilot says, who said he was black, right? And so I think it also is a way of drawing attention to the, to the race dimension, the racial dimension of drone warfare, right, um, in the film, right? So it's, it's a way of kind of um, opening causal linkages outward in all sorts of different directions, right? But here, still from the standpoint of what you have to do in order to survive as a drone pilot. The second story, then, is about this con, this couple that pulls off this con, using trousers. So they go into a, a, a hotel room, they set up all these different colored trousers in a bathroom, and then the woman dresses up seductively and whatever and goes downstairs and essentially picks up a guy, brings him back to the room, gets him to take his pants off, then the guy, her, her partner, enters the room. And of course the, the guy like, you know, and again it points to vulnerability. In fact, it's the vulnerability of white males who would rather flee the room without their trousers then, you know, be caught naked, whatever. So um, that's the story, okay? So the guy, you know, they show this and they pull out the trousers, they exchange the trousers, they take the credit card and so on. Um, and so um, part of the point is this kind of targeting, you know, it's a, it's a different version of targeting, right? So it parallels drone targeting in that way. Um, who's the victim of this? Anybody, potentially, right? Is what the, the drone, the fictional drone pilot says. And then at the end of it, of course, the journalist says, well, what's the, what does this have to do with drones? And this time, the answer is quite startling. He says, nothing. I work in casino security now. We tell these stories to make our life a little less boring. Okay, so that's the moral of this story. Okay, so what's happened now? We have a shift in focus from what you need to do in order to be a drone pilot to a kind of disaffected position of the drone pilot having you know, stopped being a drone pilot because they're suffering from PTSD and you know, telling these stories in order to um, entertain themselves. And, and it's, 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 um, it's not true that, that, that it has nothing to do with drones, right? It has everything to do with drones, right? Because anything, I mean, the film is trying to construct the idea that anything has to do with drones, right? That the causal networks are leading everywhere, okay? So the third story, which I'm gonna show you a clip from, is, um, is a story that, that is about a white suburban family that goes on vacation, and um, they get in their station wagon, and they drive out um, of the city, and in fact, they're um, they're driving to, you know, they're, 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 the where they're driving is not like highways like we we know we know them. They're driving on dirt roads in what looks like Yemen or Afghanistan or whatever, right? So there's a superimposition of their effort to take a vacation with um, being in the terrain of you know that's being surveilled by drones. Okay, uh, so let me show you a bit of that. The men spot the car and stop what they're doing. They step onto the road and watch as the family gets nearer. Dad can see that one of them has a shovel and the other two have some working tools, or maybe sticks. Are they shepherds? There are no goats anywhere, no sheep, no camels. The earth on the side of the road is like hard clay. Digging into it with one shovel is no walk in the park. Dad stops the car about 50 feet away. He can see the men very clearly now. The one with the shovel is younger, almost a teenager. He wears a traditional headdress. The other two are older. They're dressed in clothes more typical to tribes from further south, and they're armed with Kalashnikovs. Dad looks at the men. The men look at Dad. He knows who they are and what they're doing, but he doesn't care. It's none of his business. He just wants to be allowed to pass and is not looking for trouble. One of the men waves Dad along, but also holds up his weapon. The other man approaches, 
Both he and the digger look on with suspicion. Dad edges the car forward. Just then, Mom wakes up. She sees the men and is immediately close to panicking. Dad whispers for her to be quiet and continues. The men are almost in line with the car now. They bend forward, peering in. <coughs> Fortunately, the kids are still sleeping. Dad passes the men slowly and then steps on the gas. The crisis is over and it's best to get out of here. The men watch as the car pulls away. Dad takes Mom's hand and squeezes it. Just then, a shrieking sound pierces the still air, cleaving through it like the cry of a heavenly messenger. The Hellfire missile hits the ground before anyone can react, nearly vaporizing the three men on impact. The pickup truck takes most of the damage, but the station wagon isn't spared. It pulls up ahead and waits, generously, patiently. Time passes. Time is on my side. Seeing the world from above doesn't just flatten things. It sharpens them. It makes relationships clearer. The family continues their journey. Okay. Um, so what one this story isn't followed up then by the scene the repetition of the scene where the journalist asks the drone pilot, what's the moral of the story, right? And I take it because, what is this scene? This is a scene of a suburban white family that would normally, you know, and it's referred to in the scene repeatedly when the, the narrator tells us that the father didn't care what was going on there, he just wanted to get by it. Once they were done, it was, you know, finished, whatever. So uh, 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 the, the, the consciousness of us, uh, from the standpoint of a suburban white family that doesn't think it needs to think about this drone operation beyond its own efforts to get on vacation, right? And the fact that it actually then is implicated in the drone strike speaks for itself, right? I mean, I think that's the point um, here, right? Um, that the moral is really that this involves everybody, right? Um, and in fact, the, it's interesting that the clip ends with this testament to the clarity that comes from the vision of the drone machine, because the entire logic of, of um, a FOSS film, which is really to assert the causal force of incremental relations that occur outside of visibility, that occur in all kinds of registers, is, is against that, right? So speaking of his motivations in making the film, Faust himself singles out the inherent contradiction in being there and not being there that distinguishes drone killing as a singular kind of warfare. Yet his critique and the ethical injunction that issues from it eschews a narrow focus on the techniques of visibility in favor of a multi-leveled approach that seeks to engage the entirety of the drone machine in all of its causal effects. The machine is a system, states Faust, because it's not just a plane, it's the transmission of data, it's the satellites, it's the remote stations that are located just outside of Las Vegas, it's the people who drive there to work. This epitomizes globalization. Visibility, including the observation foregrounded in the film's title and the second interview sequence, which I want to show you in a second, that 5,000 feet is the best, is certainly included, but only as one factor among myriad others. To my mind, this approach is fundamental to the power of FOSS film, to whatever hope we might have to intervene in a killing machine that with its complex technicity multiply obscures its own operation, not simply from us, the civilian public, but from the myriad persons directly involved in it, including, most importantly, the disaffected pilot at the heart of the narrative, the very source of the spreading vulnerability that the film exfoliates. Ultimately, it is only by moving beyond the domain of visibility and engaging the drone machine in its entirety, by tracking every minute causal link it produces, right, which we could think of as like any causal link whatever or something like that, that we can be placed in a position where we cannot not recognize our own implication in its operationality. So I wanna um, their bodies will never be I wanna close by showing you the second sequence from the real drone operator. part of the second sequence, um, which um, yeah. it's pretty clear about everything else that's happening. I mean, there came a point after you know, 
25 years of doing this that it's just I, I had to think about, wow, there's so much loss of life that was a direct result of me. I mean, there's a lot of personal stuff I had to go through, a lot of chaplains I had to talk to just because. And the one factor that we talked about that helped me is that if it wasn't me who was doing it, then some new, some new kid would be doing it, but worse. I was 26 at the time. And a lot of people look like, how can you have PTSD if you weren't actively in a war zone? Well, technically speaking, every single day I was active in a war zone. I mean, I may not have been personally in harm, but I was directly affecting people's lives over there every single day. Um, there's stress that comes with that. I mean, having a fire, having a, to see some of the, the death, to, to see what's going on, um, having anxiety. Looking back on a certain situation or incident over and over and over, you know, uh, bad dreams, loss of sleep. You know, it's not like a video game. I can't switch it off. It's always there. Just, um, just there was a lot of stress with that. They kind of call it virtual stress. Okay, so just as a concluding, as a conclusion, I would say um, the, the film multiplies perspectives from which we could observe the drone logic, but none of these perspectives are perspectives that can be claimed to be ours, right? So I would say there are perspectives that are produced by the logic of this machine itself as it's mediated through this technical mediation of the film, right? Um, but importantly, not perspectives of our own understanding, um, but perspectives you know, of, of the worldly operation of this drone logic. So thank you very much.